next speaker, Swami Yuktatmananda, is a spiritual leader and minister of the Ramakrishna Vivekananda Center of New York, a position he has held since 2007. Prior to this, Swami Yuktatmananda was minister of the Vedanta Society of St. Petersburg, Florida. Before coming to the United States, the Swami served at the Advaita Ashrama at Mayavati in the Himalayas, where he was editor for three years of the Prabuddha Bharata Awakened India, the English language journal on religion and philosophy published by the Ramakrishna Order. It is now my great pleasure to introduce Swami Yuktatmananda, who will speak tonight on Sister Nivedita. Friends, I'm happy to be here this evening. Um, within the time allotted to me, I'll try to uh, briefly uh, discuss Sister Nivedita's life uh, and reflect on a few incidents from her life. Swami Vivekananda <coughs> once said, what we want is Shraddha. What makes the difference between man and man is the difference in the Shraddha and nothing else. What makes one man great and another weak and low is this Shraddha. The Shraddha is an important word in Sanskrit which is inadequately translated as faith because of uh, want of a better word. But Shraddha in our context <coughs> means faith in the teachings of the Guru and the scriptures. Sri Shankaracharya defines Shraddha in his Viveka Chudamani as Shastreshu Guru Vakeshu Satya Buddhi Avadharanam. A firm conviction that the teachings of the scriptures and of the Guru are true. Shraddha also means faith in our true nature as divine and faith in our capacity to realize that ideal. The divinity is latent in us. Shraddha is not just static faith, but it's a dynamic quality which keeps on inspiring us, inspiring our thoughts and actions until we reach the goal. Sister Nivedita was endowed with the Shraddha. She was a unique disciple of Swami Vivekananda. She was an Irish disciple and uh, she dedicated her whole life. She left her, uh, uh, her past, her place, her people, came to India, followed Swami Vivekananda and did a lot for women's education in India. And also she inspired many, um, many leaders of her time who were, uh, who were busy with uh, the Indian freedom struggle. So we'll briefly uh, look at her life. Nivedita lived hardly 44 years. Her guru, Swami Vivekananda, lived, he didn't live to see 40. So both were brief lives. But she was an embodiment of energy, strength, and uh, she could brave any obstacle in her chosen mission. When she tried to impart women's education in Calcutta, during those days, the society was so close and uh, people People thought that uh, she's a Christian woman and uh, probably she would come to convert us and people would, after she, she had to go from door to door to encourage people to send their uh, girls to her school, Sister Navy the girls' school. And uh, the people would consider their house to be polluted and after she left, she would sprinkle, they would sprinkle some Ganges water to, to, to so-called purify their house. So she didn't mind all that because she was endowed with that Shraddha. When we are endowed with the Shraddha, it gives us strength to surmount any obstacles, and no obstacle is too great. And she, she believed that Swami Vivekananda was with her. She was born on 28th October, 1867, exactly 150 years back. And her uh, name was Margaret Elizabeth Noble. She was very serious and sincere about her studies. And uh, she was a brilliant student and finished her schooling when she was 17. To help her mother financially, she took up a job in a boarding school as a teacher. And afterwards, she worked in a couple of other schools and then started her own school in Wimbledon. She became a supporter of the new education movement in England. From 1884 to 1894, 
Margaret spent as a school teacher. She was, she was a member of the Sesame Club. She became well known among the literary elite of her times, like uh, Bernard Shaw, Keats, and Huxley. Margaret had a Christian background, but her own religion failed to satisfy her, satisfy her spiritual hunger. She had that spiritual aspiration, and uh, uh, some of the dogmas of her own religion uh, didn't appear to be rational to her. And she began to study the life and philosophy of Buddha, which, uh, which really provided her some, some kind of a framework, and it gave her some peace. In October 1895, Swami Vivekananda came to London. In October 18, in 1895, he was in New York. He gave those uh, famous eight lectures on Karma Yoga. He was in Thousand Island Park. And then in October, he came to London. And uh, on 15th November, <coughs> the same year, Lady Isabel Margison arranged for Swami Vivekananda to give a parlor talk at her home and invited some of her friends. Margaret was among them. Then Margaret, later noble, later uh, Sister Nivedita, wrote her impressions about Swamiji, about her meeting with Swami Vivekananda in her uh, brilliant biography of Swami Vivekananda, the master as I saw him. In Swami Vivekananda's talks, she heard something new, something inspiring, something that would lead her to fulfillment. Swami Vivekananda said, all of our struggle is only for freedom. We seek neither misery nor happiness, but freedom. Man is not traveling from error to truth, but from lower truth to higher truth. It's very good to be born in a church, but it's very bad to die there. She took notes, she took elaborate notes to study Swami Vivekananda's teachings in depth. And her, uh, her, her eager mind, which really was looking for some really real living philosophy, absorbed Swami Vivekananda's teachings like a sponge. <laughs> she later recorded her first impression. I had recognized the heroic fiber of the man and desired to make myself the servant of his love for his own people. But it was his character to which I had thus done obeisance. <laughs> Swami Vivekananda stayed in London till 27th of November of that year. And during that period, he gave several lectures on Jnana Yoga, the yoga of uh, knowledge. Margaret waited for a few more months. Swami Vivekananda then returned to the US. And Margaret waited for a few more months for Swami Vivekananda's return. He returned in April 1896 to continue his lectures on Jnana Yoga. Then he said, what the world wants today is 20 men and women who can dare to stand in the street yonder and say that they possess nothing but God. Who will go? Why should one fear? <laughs> Margaret considered that message to be for herself. She accepted the challenge and uh, began to correspond with Swami Vivekananda. Swami Vivekananda wrote to her, because these are all important portions, though the time is brief, I would like to dwell on these things. Then we'll just, uh, we, will, we will quickly survey what she did later. Swami Vivekananda wrote to her on 7th June 1896. Dear Miss Noble, my ideal indeed can be put into a few, few words, and that is to preach unto mankind their divinity and how to make it manifest in every movement of their life. Who will give the world light? Sacrifice in the past has been the law, and it will be, alas, for ages to come. The earth's bravest, bravest and best will have to sacrifice themselves for the good of, good of the many, for the welfare of all. Buddhas by the hundred are necessary with eternal love and pity. The religions of the world have become lifeless mockeries. What, what the world wants is character. The world is in need of those whose life is one burning love, selfless. That love will make every word tell like thunderbolt. Awake, awake, great ones. The world is burning with misery. Can you sleep? Let us call and call till the sleeping gods awake, till the God within answers to the call. So Margaret was naturally very much inspired and overwhelmed, and she listened to this divine call and felt an urge to dedicate herself to the noble cause. Swami Vivekananda told, in the course of a conversation with Margaret, 
I have plans for the women of my own country in which you, I think, could be of great help to me. Later, Nimedita wrote a letter to a friend from India. Suppose he had not come to London that time, life would have been like a headless torso. For I always knew that I was waiting for something. I always said that a call would come, and it did. So he found her master in Swami Vivekananda. Then Swami Vivekananda traveled three months in Europe, and then finally left for India from London on 16th December 1896. Swamiji wrote to her, <clears throat> let me tell you frankly, that I am now convinced that you have a great future in the work for India. What was wanted was not a man, but a woman, a real lioness, to work for the Indians, women especially. Your education, sincerity, purity, immense love, determination, and above all, the Celtic blood <coughs> make you just the woman wanted. Yet the difficulties are many. You must think well before you plunge in. On my part, I promise you, I will stand by you unto death, whether you work for India or not, whether you give up Vedanta or remain in it. That was Swami Vivekananda's promise. And Sister Nivedita had had that Shraddha in what Swami Vivekananda said. She left London, came to Calcutta. Swami Vivekananda received uh, her at the, at the port and uh, escorted her to a devotee's house. And she began, she began to be acquainted with the, the place and people, new place, new, new people, new culture, and uh, she had dedicated herself. So it, it, was, it was a hard climb, but she was prepared for it. Her, her shraddha really propelled her from within to, to really finish to perfection whatever she had taken upon herself. Every morning, Swami Vivekananda would have a breakfast with her and with uh, Miss McLeod, who had come there by then who asked him, Swamiji, how can I serve you best? Love India. Swami Vivekananda said, Swamiji began to train Margaret, teaching her India's religion, culture, history, philosophy, scriptures, spiritual tradition, and so on. But it was Sister Nivedita's genius, coming from a different culture, to absorb all this. Later, when she started Sister Nivedita Girls' School, she used to give classes on Indian history, which History is a subject which is not everyone's cup of tea, but Indian history, she absorbed that and she used to teach the children. She used to speak glorifyingly of Swami Vivekananda. And Swami Vivekananda gradually made her acceptable to the Hindus. He, <coughs> he employed various methods. He arranged for uh, Sister Nivedita to speak at the Star Theatre on the influence of spiritual thoughts on India in England and invited the elite of Calcutta society. So she made a deep impression on them. Swami Vivekananda taught Sister Nivedita Kali worship and uh, arranged for her to lecture on Kali at Kali Ghat, that famous Kali temple in South Calcutta, which was a stronghold of uh, Hindu society. And uh, more important, Swami Vivekananda introduced Nivedita, Sarah Bull, and Josephine McLeod <coughs> to Holy Mother Sri Sharada Devi. And Holy Mother accepted them without any reserve whatsoever. That uh, unlettered, so-called unlettered woman from Jairambati, the rural area, she had, she had that, uh, that magnanimity because she is worshipped as none other than the Divine Mother herself. No one is a stranger, my child. The whole world is your own. That's her message. Holy Mother asked her, what's your name? Miss Margaret Elizabeth Noble. Holy Mother said, that's a mouthful for me. <laughs> I won't be able to pronounce that. I would call you Kuki. Kuki means a child, a little child. And when uh, Swami Swarupananda translated this to Sister Nivedita, she was, she was very, very happy. She said, yes, I am a child of the Holy Mother. And when the Orthodox people in Bagh Bazar learned that Holy Mother had made Nivedita her own, they accepted her gradually. And another important event is when a plague struck Calcutta, Sister Nivedita served those affected by this plague in Bagh Bazar. She cleaned the streets, nursed the poor people in the slums, and her unselfish love and service conquered the hearts of the people. There are so many things in detail to be seen about Sister Nivedita's serving plague-affected people without 
um, minding her own convenience, inconvenience, discomfort, but uh, we don't have time for all that. When Sister Nivedita wanted Swami Vivekananda's opinion about her work, the work that had taken upon herself, starting a school for women, Swami Vivekananda said, you ask me to criticize your work, but, I, but that I cannot do, for I regard you as inspired, quite as much inspired as I am. So I shall help you do whatever you think best. And on 12th November 1898, Kali Puja Day, she opened the school. Holy Mother visited the school, and then uh, accompanied by several women, and, Swami, and it was later followed by a visit from Swami Vivekananda. And he pointed out to Nivedita, and your own work among the women is important. Stir them up. You're going to learn everything from your pupils. And he gave her this important instruction. Never complain of not having enough time for prayer and meditation. You must unite within yourself the practical spirit and culture of the perfect citizen with love of poverty, purity, and complete abandonment of self. Those are the conditions under which your faith will blossom. Reveal your unlimited power after you yourself have completely renounced it. A stern tapasya, austerity, will discipline you. My mission is not Ramakrishna's, nor Vedanta's, nor anything, but simply to bring manhood to this people. So Sasa Dimedita dedicated herself wholly to this school, which just consisted of a handful of students, girls, just some four or five. We'll just see briefly what Holy Mother said to some of her disciples about the hardships that Sister Nivedita had to undergo. Look at Nivedita, a Western girl who came to our country and worked happily for bearing insult and harassment and also enduring so much discomfort. She tried to educate our children. When she visited some homes to get their children for her school, she was humiliated. Some did not allow her to go inside their homes and some allowed her to get in, but later purified the place by sprinkling Ganges water. She saw everything, but did not mind. She left the place with a smiling face. There is no bounden necessity for her to educate the girls of our country by enduring such insult and ill treatment and ruining her life, little by little. You see, my daughter Nivedita had such a wonderful mind that she took over the responsibility to teach our girls on her own shoulder because her guru, Naren, wanted and asked her to do it. She did not care for physical suffering or discomfort, insult and incivility of people for whom she dedicated her life. Under such circumstances, could the women of our country sacrifice such a great extent for the sake of that guru? <coughs> so Sister Nimedita, in running the school, had to brave uh, many difficulties. There was no electricity, and uh, there is, Calcutta is known for heat and humidity, unprecedented. Um, most of the time, only some November, December, and January, February, probably those four months, you get some respite from the heat and humidity. But otherwise, uh, you can imagine this, the hardships under which Sister Nimedita had to work. And uh, she spoke to her students about uh, um, Swami Vivekananda. And Swami Vivekananda took her to the West when he went to the West for the second time because Nivedita wanted funds to run her school. And uh, she, could, she could get some funds, and then uh, she gave some lectures in Chicago, and then she came back, and Swami Vivekananda passed away, we know, on July 4th, 1902. The, the brief entry in Sister Nivedita's diary was, Swami died. Uh, we could imagine what a great blow this uh, Swami's passing, Swamiji's passing was on these, on everyone, right from Swami Brahmananda. Swami Vivekananda said he would continue to inspire mankind until the whole world shall know that it is one with God. So Sister Nimedita didn't have time. She didn't, she didn't lament Swami Vivekananda's passing, but she felt he's not dead. He's always with us. I cannot even grieve. I only want to work. So she continued work, and uh, Swami Vivekananda had uh, forecast about Nivedita. India shall ring with her. And she wrote, my task is to awaken the nation. <laughs> Sister Nivedita was a great influence on the freedom fighters of her time. She was a great art critic, and uh, she could really, when, for example, someone, 
uh, when he drew a picture of uh, Swami Vivekananda, Sri Ram, Swami's sister Nivedita said, Swami Vivekananda never dressed with so many clothing because he, he lived in a tropical place. He was, you see Buddha, Buddha's image does not have many thick clothing on him. So similarly, Swami Vivekananda was a Buddha. And someone else was, uh, had painted a picture of Sri Rama's mother, Kausalya. This Kausalya and Dasharatha. Kausalya was using a palm leaf fan, according to the artist. She said, uh, who gave you this idea? She was a queen. She should have used a, you, should, you should have used an ivory fan. And what an ivory fan is, you go to this museum, you, you can know what that fan is. So she had that kind of a, uh, an insight, that kind of a perception into art. And at one point, she started, she, she deeply involved herself with the freedom fighters. And uh, since politics is something that the Ramakrishna order has kept away from, she, she officially dissociated herself from the Ramakrishna order, but she continued to sign her name, Sister Nivedita of Ramakrishna Vivekananda. But one thing, this Sister Nivedita is her monastic name. Swami Vivekananda had initiated her into Brahmacharya. So she was a nun, and her starting the Sister Nivedita Girls School was some kind of, uh, some kind of uh, an establishment of the later Sharadamat. It was a convent which blossomed into the Sharadamat later. So we saw about the plague relief and uh, Sri Aurobindo of her time, he said she was a veritable live wire. And Subhash Chandra Bose, he told Dilip Roy, those who try to denigrate our country because of a thousand disgraceful oppressions, I ask them to read the master as I saw him. I do not know of any other disciple as great as Nivedita, nor any other guru as great as Swami Vivekananda. Sister Nivedita was, she, she gave lectures, she wrote books, um, the Master as I saw him, the web of Indian life, cradle tales of Hinduism. She awakened Indian people from their uh, moribund condition through her divine power and unselfish love. And her passing, she passed away in uh, Darjeeling. During her last moment, she chanted this mantra from the Brahdhananik Upanishad, Asatoma Sadgamaya, Tamasoma Jyotir Gamaya, Mrityorma Amritam Gamaya. And uh, she was very fond of this particular prayer. And she said, the boat is sinking, but I shall see the sunrise. Thus, Nivedita, she merged into the divine light. And Nivedita's ashes were brought to Belurmat and installed in a niche of Swami Vivekananda's shrine, to which flowers are offered every day by the monk who does puja. So that's about it in brief. I'm not sure if I exceeded my time. Uh, I am. Uh, uh, so it, it's a great inspiration. The more we study her, uh, one thing, when we begin to study Nivedita for the first time, the English is so dated. So it's, re it's really so difficult for us to study her. We really, even to study one or two pages is difficult. But once you, what you call, hold on to it and then study, her inspiration, her shraddha is enough. We, we, we can charge ourselves with that faith and uh, think of her and uh, try to grow in strength in Shraddha ourselves. Thank you very much.